Hello, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural lecture of Alt New College. Uh, my name is Libby Harity. Many of you zooming in from New College of Florida will recognize my face as the former Senate president and uh, leader of the student protest movement out there at New College of Florida. I'm currently zooming into you from Smith College, which is not where I go to school now. I go to Hampshire, but I had a class here today. So that's where they've got me hanging out for this Zoom call. So thank you all for coming. Again, this is the first of a series of lectures that's going to be offered by this program that's going to be called Alt New College. So this is an initiative by New College alumni uh, and supporters trying to make sure that we can offer academic freedom and various other forms of support to uh, members of the faculty and the student body who have been affected by the takeover at New College. Um, so. The second one, so this is the first one, second one this is going to be at 1215 tomorrow. That's going to be on National Ro Voter Registration Day. It's going to be called Young People Can Change America, Youth Voting and Political Power. It's going to be featuring David Hogg. Uh, so uh, it's going to be the founder of, of Leaders We Deserve. It's going to also be featuring Brianna Sia, who's the executive director of a nonprofit called Gen Vote. And then Evan Mulbro, who's the director of the Andrew Goodman Foundation. So these are all going to be individuals who have significant pull in the uh, world of voter registration and the registration of young voters. And we're going to have more talks featuring people like Neil Gaiman, who we have connections to, which is crazy. Maya Wiley, who you may have already seen if you were present at alt graduation last year, uh, and Naomi Oreskes. But... You're all here today because we've got Judith Butler and Masha Gessen, my friends. So Professor Butler, as many of you, my fellow queer people probably know, is a philosopher, distinguished professor in the graduate school at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, various contributions, including but not limited to gender trouble, identities and bodies that matter. But most importantly, right now, you guys should worry about Judith Butler's new book coming out. It's called Who's Afraid of Gender? It's going to be published early 2024 by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. So that is exciting. We're also so lucky to be welcoming Masha Gessen. They are a distinguished professor at Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. They're also a distinguished visiting writer at Bard College, a staff writer at The New Yorker, and the author of various books, including but not limited to The Rights of Lesbian and Gay Men in the Russian Republic and The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia and Surviving Autocracy. So all of that is so cool and exciting. Oh my gosh, we're going to get into why this discussion is so important and what the topic of this talk is, which is the authoritarian attack on gender studies. So I'm so lucky and honored to turn the floor over to Professors Geshen, Geshen and uh, Butler. Thank you, Libby. Judith, it's such an honor always to talk to you. Uh, and I have to say, I'm going to to ask, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with, um, with asking you to remember something that is probably not terribly pleasant to remember, uh, but I have to say that every time I hear uh, somebody bring up, and this, this happens more and more often, obviously, the connection between autocracy and uh, ideas of gender ideology um, and attacks on gender studies, I flash to a video I saw about six years ago of you and your partner, Wendy Brown, in an airport in Brazil. Uh, am I right to flash to that? And can you talk, can you talk about what happened that day? Um, yes, well, thank you. Um, I'm, I just wanna say, first of all, uh, Libby, um, I have great respect for you and, um, all the students and the faculty who've been fighting the destruction of academic freedom and fighting the, uh, the right-wing efforts to keep you from studying, knowing, seeing, learning all the, uh, the rights that you have um, as a student. And, um, and of course, um, 
the faculty there uh, who have lost tenure um, or who are being threatened with the loss of tenure because their point of view or their field of study is considered uh, not just unacceptable, but dangerous, um, according to um, DeSantis and Rufo and the um, the quite uh, terrifying group of conservatives who are uh, threatening higher education, setting a terrible model in the US and in the world. Um, and yes, I'm honored to be here with uh, Masha Gessen, always uh, someone from whom I learn. Um, Masha, yes, it was uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I was giving a talk and actually helping to organize a conference on democracy. Um, and there was a large crowd outside of that conference uh, that burnt me in effigy, a kind of terrible distorted picture of me. And um, I was held responsible for gender ideology. I didn't really know what that was. I kind of heard that there was a right-wing fantasy that gender was a totalitarian movement. And I didn't take it too seriously before that moment, but I saw as the security people surrounded me and I was forbidden from walking out in the street by myself, that um, it was a pretty serious, angry, um, uh, potentially an actually violent crowd. Um, luckily there was a counter protest at the same time. And those were the people who were saying that um, gender sexuality are issues that we all need to think about. They are forms of freedom. They are uh, being rethought in ways that are more humane and more complex and should be affirmed. Uh, so I, I met wonderful people there and I did encounter some pretty ferocious and terrifying ones. In the airport, um, Wendy Brown and I were uh, attacked and a woman came at me with a uh, trolley, big metal trolley, uh, uh, um, calling me a, a pedophile. And it was like, oh, ped pedophile, why would I be a pedophile? That seemed really quite um, absurd. Um, and uh, luckily for me, a young man in a backpack whose name I do not know, intervened and stopped her and actually got on the floor fighting with her as I um, took the escalator to the security uh, uh, area. Uh, it was a terrifying experience and it did uh, lead me to ask, what is this anti-gender ideology movement? Um, who are these people? Uh, what do they want? What do they fear? Uh, how are they organized? Um, and this is a, a good question because at that time, it was something that I encountered in Latin America. I encountered it in Europe, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe as well. Um, uh, and it has mo more recently come to the US through the evangelical church, the World Congress of the Family and right-wing Catholicism mainly. And it has found its way into the attack on gender studies at New College and in several other colleges and universities throughout um, the US and Canada. Um, um, so, uh, but I asked myself, why was I being accused of pedophilia again? It seemed to me that there were people who thought that if you followed some doctrine of gender, and I wasn't even sure what they meant by that, um, you were not constrained by the taboo against homosexuality. You could break that taboo. You were free to break that taboo. Um, and that meant that you would break every other taboo, right? Incest, sex with animals, um, sex with children, etc. cetera. Um, so there was a kind of uh, somewhat wild uh, ideation about what gender studies was or what the word gender actually meant. But I also saw that these were people who were terrified that their idea of the natural and the normal family, heterosexual, patriarchal, ex sorry, exclusively heterosexual, patriarchal was being deeply destabilized by something called gender. They hadn't actually read any gender studies and they hadn't 
they didn't bother to know what the field is about or how gender operates in public policy. They didn't study the issue. They accepted a kind of phantasm of what gender is and uh, how destructive it could be uh, from church authorities and other kinds of uh, right-wing um, institutions. And as a result, it um, led them into a certain kind of frenzy um, bolstered by the Bolsonaro regime uh, at the time. Um, so I know you have a new book with a title that sounds like uh, it has directly to do with what uh, we were just talking about, but uh, the advanced reader's copy is still on its way to my um, mailbox. So um, all I can ask is, uh, am I making the right assumption? Um, I guess in this book of forthcoming, Who's Afraid of Gender, I am trying to figure out what is it that's being feared? You know, we used to debate in gender studies and women's studies, queer studies, okay, what's your theory of gender? Is it intersectional? Is it psychoanalytic? Is it Marxist? Um, what do you think about uh, psychologies of gender? How does gender get formed? We asked all kinds of questions and we still do. Um, but the attack on something called gender ideology um, isn't about an open debate. It's actually an effort to close down debate. They don't want us reading or writing about this topic. It's a way of trying to stop reading and stop writing and stop open discussion. Now they call us totalitarians. They say we're ideological as if we belong to some kind of uh, cult or we have a, a single doctrine that we believe in and that we impose. But that idea of us as totalitarian is actually, well, it's not just false, it's truly false. I mean, every women's studies class I've ever been in is full of debate, <laughs> conflict, differences of point of view, different methodologies, right? They're trying to work it all out is not easy at all. But um, by telling us that we are indoctrinating or that we have a single doctrine, they're actually trying to shut down thought. Uh, they don't. They want to shut down open inquiry. Um, and the shutting down of open inquiry is the destruction of academic freedom and the idea of the university itself. So, you know, it turns out that one tactic of their form of censorship is to ascribe totalitarianism to a field of study that, in fact, is very open ended. And my sense is they are frightened of the questions we pose. They're, they're frightened of the different frameworks we offer. They're frightened that we're producing too many possibilities in this world, too many forms of freedom, and they want to shut that down. They're not real. They don't really believe we're, we have a single doctrine that we impose on other people. They don't want our open questions. They want our open-ended inquiry. Um, so I don't know. Where is power in the scene? Well, the power of censorship is most definitely on their side. Um, but obviously they feel that the power is not with them. I mean, this is something that's very familiar to me from Russia, which has assumed this sort of victim position in relationship to the world, right? And where this idea of gender ideology is really central to, to creating this victim position and to saying, you know, that the West is trying to force its ideas on us, is trying to force our our families to live in ways uh, that they're not accustomed to is trying to basically dislocate every single one of us and every single family, um, and and I guess that's that's where the fear is, right? Um, when when you study fear, do you find yourself do, do you find any reserves of empathy for people who are experiencing that kind of fear? Well, you know, oddly. And the more I read uh, uh, in, in these materials, right, the, the anti-gender movement, the anti-gender ideology movement, the more I saw that it was driven by a fear of destruction. And we see, certainly see that in the, the Russian discourse and Putin's discourse, right? 
if Ukraine becomes part of the EU that will bring in the gender imperative, the new gender policies, it will enfranchise homosexuals, whatever he calls them. <laughs> uh, you know, there's this fear that there's going to be this flood of, um, of gay, lesbian, feminist agendas, and it will destroy the spiritual um, uh, uh, core of Russia itself. If I understand correctly, at least his 2015 doctrine is the one that I read most recently. Um, but that's that's an you know why would that be a flood? All, all, all it is is some laws that protect people from discrimination. Um, and yet, um, in places like Hungary, you know, the argument is made, no, we don't want our market contracts with the EU to include clauses that pledge us to, to non-discrimination because we want to be free to discriminate because the freedom to discriminate against gay, lesbian, and trans people is important to our national identity. And it turns out that the other thing that's really important to their national identity is keeping migrants out, right? So like, what is this national identity, which is made of like normative, heteronormative families that all have this very specific idea of nationality and race and religion I mean, these are these are efforts uh, to resist a changing world and a complex demographic composition of our world, and to resist open borders and um, living in freedom um, with others who are perhaps living differently. I do I do think the fear of destruction is there, but I also think the fear of destruction is misnamed. <clears throat> Yes, a lot of people are losing their sense of job security. Yes, the, there's climate disaster. Yes, um, many uh, aspects of forced migration in particular are destabilizing. Um, yet why is it that we think that what's destroying the world is something called gender or critical race theory uh, or poor migrants at the border? These are, these are not forces of destruction. These are people and who are, uh, are vulnerable and who are um, subject to state violence at accelerating rates. Um, and yet they are uh, uh, nefariously cast as the forces of destruction itself. Um, so I think I think this is um, this is like one of those dinner parties where you're supposed to turn around on cue and start speaking to the person on the other side of you. And so, so, so I think this that. is what's what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm so happy to do that. Um, Masha, I know that you've written on autocracy and that in your work on Hannah Arendt, you've, you've written on totalitarianism and, I, totalitarianism. and I'm just wondering, you know, there's certain regimes that really focus on the personality of one person, like where power is really held by one person or a cadre of people around that one person. And we, we think of those as autocratic regimes. It seems to me that right now um, we're dealing with forms of authoritarianism, meaning intensified state control in lots of different areas, like control over education, um, what can be taught, what can be read, control over healthcare. Can are trans kids or gender non-conforming kids, do they have access to healthcare, uh, control at the border, like really uh, hideous border conditions for so many people seeking the right to petition for citizenship. Is it focused in a personality? Can we say DeSantis is the problem or Trump? Or do we have a more diffuse kind of authoritarianism going on? Oh, that's such an interesting idea. Um, I haven't thought about it that way, but um, <clears throat> but I think maybe I can come at it from, from a somewhat different angle, which is that uh, you know, I think a lot of the time those personalities that end up at the center of of an autocracy are arbitrary, right? and and Putin is certainly one such person. It is as though he were drafted to fill a space that was already there. There was such um, there was such a hunger for for absolutism 
for uh, for the kind of um, resentment driven politics that that he could give voice to and that he that he could embody. But he could have been anyone else. I mean, I think that Russia got particularly unlucky uh, with this arbitrarily chosen person. But I think that with almost anyone who ended up in that space, it um, would have had some version of, of, of Putinism. And I think maybe that's what we're observing in this country as well, is that we got particularly unlucky with Trump. I think Trump is unlike anyone uh, you know, who had ever certainly in, in, in my lifetime, been in the political scene in this country and who is currently in it. But but then we see so many different mini Trumps that are temperamentally um, and you know, even perhaps ideologically, right? And, uh, or politically in, 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 in the way in which they come at politics are very different from Trump, but that seem to carry out so many of the same Things and you're, you know, I'm, I'm. Um, that doesn't even begin to explain what we're observing at the border, because of course, uh, technically, nominally, uh, it's the Democratic administration, it's the Biden administration that's uh, yes, creating policy at the border, and and yet, um, it's almost seamlessly connected to Trump, uh, to Trump's politics, which were frankly not. That disconnected from Obama's politics at the border, right? So, so maybe you know a way to to think about them in a really disheartening way, but it's probably accurate is to think about um, the kind of fears that you were talking about, the fear of destruction that's dry, uh, that's demanding uh, these kinds of of policies that are perhaps um, presented differently by different administrations, but in substance are the same. Uh, and and uh, and reflect the reflect the same fears and demands, and of course the same lack of defenders for uh, for people in, uh, who are coming to this country seeking international protection and have no one to speak up for them. Yeah, and are we seeing also perhaps um, a kind of retrenchment of masculinity of a certain kind? I mean, it it seems to me like in a way one could say, well, DeSantis is like Trump or a different Trump, but it seems to me that um, DeSantis's willingness to, um, well, destroy academic freedom, destroy academic institutions, attack lesbian and gay and trans people attack racial minorities or teaching the history of slavery in this country, that, that there's something about this shameless hatred that um, belongs to a certain idea of masculinity that knows no bounds, that has no restriction, that does what it wants, that hates as it wishes, and that is weirdly uh, admired by people who feel relatively powerless in their in their lives. Like, oh, look at what this guy's willing to say. Look at what this guy's willing to do. Is there some retrenchment of masculinity going on in these figures? And are they are they different from one another? Um, I think that's probably an absolutely accurate description. Uh, it's uh, it's again not quite the way I'm used to thinking about it. I mean, it, it, everything you've just said sounds uh, sounds completely accurate. Um, there is there is this appeal in this kind of politics to um, to being your worst self, right? uh, and it's um, <clears throat> it's. Uh, I mean, I, I I really think that that. The Trumpian invitation is to that. Right? Uh, let's uh, and you know I think of that as as as, as fascist politics. That's definitely um, uh, that sort of uh, uh, we we know uh, from the history of Nazi Germany how important this idea of throwing off the pretense, the hypocrisy of, of, of civilized politics was and how um, and how this sort of this 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 invitation to um, 
to perform aggression, uh, to perform hatred, to to engage in your worst impulses, to be real in your badness, was uh, was, was so incredibly powerful. And I think I think that's sort of uh, I mean that, that, that's how I think of it. I think we can certainly accurately say that it's also a retrenchment of a certain of a certain kind of masculinity. Um, it's also, of course fascinating that the list that you went through, right, the, um, the attacks on, uh, on academic institutions, the attacks on migrants, the t- attacks on LGBT people, they almost seem like they come from the same playbook, uh, as though there were a checklist that they were going down, which I don't think is the case. I think a lot of it is instinctive. I mean, I think a lot of it comes from, of course, observing one another and being inspired. Um, but but there is there is a uh, there is a, an almost intuitive set of of others who um, who are opposed uh, who are seen as 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 naturally in opposition to this kind of politics, and so without having to have a playbook, without having to have a checklist, all these political leaders basically engage in the same things. I'm wondering whether the term fascism is appropriate to describe some of what we're seeing, given the fact that uh, these governments um, in the US um, and elsewhere are actually involved in in rights stripping activities, uh, taking away rights that have been established and establishing groups of people as unworthy of having rights. Um, I, I worry about that. I worry about the the passions of hatred that, well, we could say these politicians are stoking those passions, but we also have to say, look, something's happening among the people where these hatreds are also there. You know, they're already there. They're there to be stoked. They're there to be inflamed. Um, And I think that's part of what we need to see is, is that it's not just coming from these figures, but um, these figures know how to pull on those passions and inflame them. And, you know, my own sense is that we're seeing fascist passions stoked in the service of increasingly authoritarian regimes. I don't know whether that's true. I have a feeling you would have a better sense than I do. Um, I, I've I've decided to take because I've 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 thought about this a lot because I uh, I have had to write about this in sort of in real time quite a bit, and I've decided to use a very pragmatic uh, metric to to decide whether to use the word fascism. If it's helpful to the conversation, I will use it, um, and if I think that there is too much of a risk of going down the rabbit hole of uh, arguing well but but you know but they haven't done this or they haven't quite gone quite this far uh but you're comparing them to a regime that killed six million people uh that's just not terribly productive uh and um you know i think the truth is that we're living at a, in a time when uh meeting some kind of uh formal definition of fascism has become become Basically trivial. It, um, there, uh, there are a lot of political situations in this country and uh, and in Europe that rise easily, and in Latin America that rise easily to, uh, and in Israel that rise easily to this uh, to the definition of of, uh, of fascism. So then, what happens uh, if uh, if if you use it in conversation, does it actually move the conversation forward? But at the same time, I also think that it's important to to not neglect the word fascism. If for no other reason, uh, then it will be used by the other side, just as um, the word totalitarianism has been bizarrely, as you pointed out, claimed uh, by the other side. So I think a kind of rigorous uh, approach to language and um, and you know, using using powerful political terms intentionally and arguing for their use is actually a really important part of the conversation. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, both of you, for those super, super awesome discussion uh, points. Now we're going to move into the point that everybody watching is really excited about, which is the question and answer portion. Um, but I get to ask my questions first, but everybody in the audience, please look down. You'll see a question Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen, if I'm not mistaken. Use that to stick your questions in there, and I will be looking through those picking some out after my first couple questions. So super generally, professors, very, very basic. Why is gender studies important? Why do we need to keep it in higher education? I think um, gender studies is uh, first and foremost a way of thinking about how power is organized in society. Um, and um, we have to ask questions about uh, why is it that uh, there are uh, enormous uh, wage differentials still between men and women. We have to ask questions about um, uh, uh, versions of masculinity and femininity that have been passed down um, over time and across cultures that serve us or that do not serve us? What do they make possible? What do they repress and rule out? Um, how do we think about uh, gender norms that are taught to children? How do we think about um, uh, the distribution of labor? Who's doing housework? Who's doing reproductive labor? Who's supposed to be monopolizing the public sphere? Um, what do we know about how people identify as genders? Um, it's a very complex matter. Uh, you got assigned a sex, but does that mean you become the gender that that sex assignment seems to imply, or maybe not? What are, what what do we know about the the life stories of people, uh, the different ways in which sex assignment is actually lived, and what do we think about the medical technologies that have um, establish the binary between men and women as the only possible way to think about gender. Gender studies involves history, involves sociology, involves multiple cultural and linguistic contexts. It's very hard to make large generalizations without doing very specific work. So there's an empirical basis to gender studies that's absolutely indispensable. There's also a theoretical set of questions that have emerged from gender studies, including um, what do we mean by woman and man? And are those the only two categories? <laughs> um, and do they work the same way in every language? And have they changed through time? Uh, certainly, once we open those questions up, the world looks differently. For some, it's very exciting. And as we've noted, for some, it's apparently terrifying. Awesome. Thank you so much, Professor Butler. That's a great answer to a pretty broad question. So here's another question focused specifically towards Professor Gessen. Uh, you're the expert on the whole Russia thing. How does what's going on in Florida and elsewhere in the United States right now remind you of what you might have seen, experienced, studied in Russia and other authoritarian countries? Why does gender studies stick out as something that they feel the need to cling to? Um, <clears throat> it does remind me a lot and very, very in a very frightening way uh, uh, of what has happened in Russia. It's as though some of the th things, same things were happening, but faster. Uh, in Russia, we saw attacks on LGBT people, followed by attacks on media, followed by attacks on higher education. Um, and uh, apologies for this. Uh, and um, uh, and actually, it unfolded slower in Russia than it is unfolding in Florida. Uh, and um, I think that in, uh, I'll make this very fast, right? I, th I think that in particular targeting LGBT people in this day and age uh, has a lot to do with signaling to uh, uh, to the people of the state, or in the case of uh, Russia, the people of the of, of the country, 
that social change will be reversed, right? That uh, what they have experienced, what has made them uncomfortable, what has made them scared, or what they have now come to believe has made them uncomfortable and scared can all be made to go away. Right? And LGBT people as the people who, uh, who have gained rights most recently, who, um, who have been at the center of the most rapid and most profound social change of the last, say, decade and a half, two decades, um, become automatic scapegoats in this situation, right? Uh, if you want to go, the message is if you want to go back to an imaginary past where you didn't have to deal with any of this, where men were men and women were women, uh, and uh, and everybody felt safe and secure, then we're going to make that happen by for you by making LGBT people go away. Another fantastic answer, pretty pretty thorough. Um, so I'm now looking down at our our Q and A here, um, and this is something that's been expressed in a couple of questions, but I'm gonna read this question as asked by our friend at New College, Claire Robinson. How do you work through, parentheses, emotionally, the fear and the backlash or the violence that you can and could face by writing and teaching the theories that you do? Um, well, there, there is for me a, a somewhat simple answer to that, which is to become part of networks of solidarity and not to try to be a heroic individual. <laughs> you know, don't be the one person who stands up to power. You, you actually need your communities. You need solidarity. It means, it means digital connections. It means close people nearby, but we all need solidarity. And we, uh, we not only need it for our own psychological survival, especially when we're attacked or mocked or derided or threatened physically, or when people close to us are literally killed or beaten um, by standing up for certain kinds of rights. Um, um, and, and we see this with LGBTQ rights often, unfortunately. Um, I... We need it not just for our psychological survival. We also need it because we have to be building political communities that um, prefigure the world we want to live in, uh, that show people what world is possible, where you live together, you cohabit with radical differences and without necessarily being radically threatened by one another. I mean, for those people who want the return to the ideal world where men are men and women are women, as Masha says, I mean, they may think that their stability and security resides there in the recapturing of such a world. But that world is always a fantasy because that world was never safe for the rest of us, right? That, that world was producing massive suffering for the rest of us. <laughs> that world was not a place of freedom for the rest of us. So it was always destabilized by its own repressive character, right? It was going to explode or it was going to change because people want to live in freedom and people want to live without fear. That's right. I, I could not agree more. Um, another question that we're getting a lot in the chat here and something that I'm personally uh, looking to, to learn more about, especially now as I relocate to the Northeast at Hampshire College, what can gender studies departments but not just them, the entire system of higher education, what can people in there start doing now to help combat what's going on, the fight against gender studies? It's hard on Zoom, but I think Masha's looking at me to say, you, you take this one, Butler. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, look, um, the first thing within academic universities is to make sure that um, faculty governance structures are in place, that the faculty are deciding the curriculum, not the board of trustees, not the governor of the state, right? They, they have no business intervening on questions of teaching and curricula, which are properly decided by faculty, whether that means unionizing as a faculty or shoring up faculty governance or shoring up principles of academic freedom, which include faculty governance, 
That is what has to happen. And that means taking advantage of every possible professional organization that will help you make that case. Um, it also means trying in the political field to stop interventions into uh, faculty governance that have no place there. Gender and women's studies programs have long been connected through professional organizations like the National Women's Studies Association. I know they're all over this. That's really important. It's also important to be part of international organizations that are fighting this same kind of thing in different places. I mean, when we're we're sitting in Florida, we're sitting in Wyoming, and we have a struggle. It seems like it's right there, and this is the struggle, and it's happening here. It's true, but there are many here's, and they're they're happening everywhere. You know, they happened in Budapest. They are happening in Uganda. They're happening in um, in in many places in the world. Uh, in the UK, uh, where the trans exclusionary feminists are attacking gender studies and even the concept of gender, they sound like right wing pundits. It's it's a frightening prospect. So you know we need to make make the strongest alliances we can and to pool our resources and to decide our strategies um, within such organizations and networks. Awesome. Thank you, Professor Butler. And we received another question from one Stephen Tremaine in the chat um, asking me what I want administrations and institutions to do. Thank you, one, for, for wanting to ask me a, me a question. I'm just a little guy. But that that's what I want. That's what I want to see. Um, we have another great question coming from Nick Clarkson. Um, and this is a pretty, pretty long one, so I'm going to read it as it's been written. Are there commonalities in the rhetorical landscape across authoritarianisms? I'm thinking about Chris Rufo's intentional misuse of key terms. For example, it's been really disorienting to be the target of so much misinformation from trustees, politicians, et cetera, from one side and the limits of what can be said in a quote in the paper on the other. It's been difficult to figure out who I'm speaking to when I speak out. Is this common to authoritarianisms? So uh, put a little uh, short, is it normal for them to completely dismantle the truth? <laughs> um, yes, I'd say that's, 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 that's pretty normal. Uh, and it's certainly normal for, um, for totalitarianisms. Uh, a totalitarian leader has to own the truth, has to own reality. Uh, in order in order to build a totalitarian regime. Um, but, you know, uh, there's something that I've been sort of flashing back to as, as, as we've had this entire conversation. Um, I, in 2016, I went to cover a meeting of the World Congress of Families, which is an international organization that purports to defend the traditional family. And that has been behind uh, a lot of uh, absolutely horrible legislation in different parts of the world. And part of my interest in covering that Congress, which happened in Tbilisi, Georgia that year, was that I, um, I, I had heard different theories of how this uh, international network of uh, right-wing uh, lobbyists and activists functioned. And one of the uh, theories was that it was a bunch of U.S. evangelicals who no longer had a foothold at home, who started exporting their values and their ideas. And the other one was, was the exact opposite. It was that it was a bunch of Russians uh, with money and ideas who wanted to create and shore up international networks of, of extreme conservatism. And what I actually saw uh, was a genuine meeting of the minds. You know, there were people from all over the world who felt, many of them felt pretty lonely where they were at that time. Uh, and they they got a hearing in Belize from people who thought like them. It also felt lonely like them and also felt victimized like them, right? I mean, victimhood is a huge part, as we've already mentioned of this whole rhetoric. But um, the reason I mention it is that a lot of the time, this idea of similarities uh, among different autocracies takes us down the path of trying to find 
the source of, uh, of, of the thing, right? The source of evil uh, and gets us into a conspiracy thinking loop. And that's really not useful, right? I think it's super useful to see the similarities so that, so that we can create solidarity networks, so that we can learn from one another, so that we can look ahead to what's coming next and, and try to protect ourselves against that uh, or better yet be proactive. But it's not useful in trying to find the source of evil um, because that's actually not how it works. Awesome, thank you, Professor. It's gonna be a little bit of a 180. Um, we've got uh, some questions regarding um, uh, brain drain in Florida. You know, Professor Gessen, I'm sure you've observed uh, this happening in the places you've studied. Uh, Professor Butler, I'm sure you've you've studied this as well. Do you see a brain drain happening and continuing in states like Florida, where these attacks on acad academic freedom are occurring? Um, you know, it's funny. I I might have a little problem with the idea of brain drain uh, because. Uh, <laughs> If you're saying that people are fleeing the state or seeking jobs or residency outside of the state because they can't live in a homophobic, transphobic, and racist environment that's uh, being uh, intensified by the the state administration, then then we have a different problem. It's not that oh, Florida doesn't have intelligent people in it. It's rather that people who are thinking critically um, or even historically or politically in grounded ways about gender, race, migration, um, and who are committed to principles of um, equality, freedom, and justice, um, that they feel that that's no longer a habitable environment for them or that they can't keep their job or they've been Rele released from their job against their will, th then we're talking about a political situation where the state is actually pushing people out who represent certain kinds of values. It's not just that intelligence is gone. I mean, maybe, yes, it is. But we are, um, we're talking about censorship and, um, and firing people and um, contesting rights of parenting and contesting employment and contesting academic freedom. Um, I mean, maybe some people think they should fight and stay, but if you're not safe, if you're not paid, if you no longer have a place to live and you're not safe in your environment or your, your community, uh, you don't know who to trust anymore. It's really hard to live there. Um, so that's the problem. Uh, is that some portion of that state and state government are pushing progressives out in an effort to make Florida a conservative state. And of course, that should be, um, that should give rise to a massive rebellion, a one that has to be sustained over time, right? So we need to learn from other kinds of political struggles, like how do you sustain a rebellion so that it can become even more powerful than rebellion. It can become revolt or it can really materialize as radical social change and even the dissolution of that regime, which is going to have to happen. So even if you move out, you still have to have a, a stake in what's happening there. So Sorry, I shifted the topic, but it felt like I kind of needed to. Sorry about that. No, I think that was perfect. And it leads me right into another question that my friends from New College, Sophia Brown and uh, Denis Nazarova, have been asking, how exactly do we combat what Sophia has been calling a chilling effect uh, that anti-gender uh, legislation and rhetoric has had on college campuses? Um, how do we talk about gender and sexuality in places where we are now prosecuted by the government for doing so? How do we defy the labels being put upon us? How do we get past all of this? 
Um, you know, I would argue for uh, taking that, that question and similar questions very literally. Like um, one of the reasons that I think it's actually useful to compare different authoritarianisms is that um, they help us see what's still possible, right? Uh, if you look at a place like Russia, where LGBT people no longer have access to any legally distributed media, where, uh, where people who would call the war in Ukraine a war no longer have access to any legally distributed media. In fact, where you can go to prison for calling the war a war even in a private conversation, right? Um, Maybe that helps, and I, you know, I'm not going to say that anybody who's living in Florida is lucky or count your blessings or anything like that. But pragmatically, it helps you see how much is still possible, how many different areas have not been shut down. Right? Uh, look for those. Right? I can't. I can't sitting at this moment in Woodstock, New York. I can't tell you exactly what's possible in Florida, but I can tell you for sure that a lot is still possible. There are a lot of avenues for speech. There's a, uh, there's a lot of media access. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities for protest. There's a lot of possibilities for study. Um, and I think that that sort of setting out to identify those possibilities and taking advantage of them of staking them out um, in part to protect their spaces, but in part just to, you know, to use them while they're still available uh, is really important. Awesome. Thank you so much for those answers. Those were both, uh, I think, addressing uh, exactly what we were looking for here. So um, this is returning to the specific new college situation um, and at gender studies as it exists in higher education. So some current members of the new college board of trustees have said that activism does not have a place in higher education. Uh, and then use that as an excuse to begin dismantling New College's gender studies program, as our friend um, Emma Nattel has written in the Q&A. So what are your thoughts on this use of there's no activism to do conservative activism in higher education? Well, dismantling gender studies programs or dismantling programs that teach about black history uh, or or the history of race in the United States or elsewhere. The, that dismantling is activist. That's conservative activism. Um, so they can say that we're doing activism, but they are doing activism <laughs> uh, through censorship and dismantling. And as you say, through in some cases, setting up situations where you can be prosecuted for even speaking about certain issues or insisting on teaching certain issues. Um, so we shouldn't think that activism is out of this picture. In fact, it's an in it's an unjustifiable activist intervention into academic freedom. That is what we are seeing. Um, so every time they say that, it is really important to relocate where the activism is. On the other hand, I do want to say that in gender studies classes, in classes on race and slavery, none of us are saying you must take this position, you must now work for this organization, you must, to, to pass this class, you must have a single political point of view. No, we don't teach like that. Teaching is about opening up complex issues and hearing various people's points of view, asking them to give evidence for the points of views that they defend, getting unsettled by points of view that you don't agree with. Um, that, is, that is the open inquiry that characterizes work in the university. It is not the same as taking a political stand or joining a political organization. Now, it may be that people who study gender studies come from political organizations or go out to them, but there's no single pipeline and there's no mandate. So the idea that we are simply ideological, that we're teaching political positions or we're mandating them or we're grooming them or we're indoctrinating them, that, that's a mistaken understanding of what we actually do. 
Um, there's also a refusal to read. There's an anti-intellectualism on the attack on gender studies and what they call critical race theory. And let's remember that Christopher Rufo is behind the national attack on critical race theory in the United States. And that he, the same person who's attacking critical race theory has been galvanizing the anti-gender ideology movement in Florida as well. So, um, and, you know, on that topic, we could say, oh, what is it they oppose in critical race theory? Well, the fact is, they don't even know what critical race theory is. They assume it means that white people are bad or that, um, or that slavery pervades U.S. history. Well, it is true. Slavery has been there since the founding of, since the discovery of the Americas through the first colonial intervention. Slavery was there. There's no question about it. But the ways in which this characterization takes place, it, it seems so inflammatory. Nobody even stops to think what is critical race theory? Is it a legal doctrine? How did it originate for what purposes in the law? How is it different from black history? What are the various points of view within law and outside of law on black studies in which we could situate critical race theory? Do we need to do some reading in order to make some grounded judgments? But this is not that kind of argument. This is an argument against reading, no books of that kind, no reading of that kind, which means that what are circulating are not judgments based in any kind of documentation, but forms of censorship and persecution that are deeply anti-intellectual and that wanna shut down our minds and yours. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Butler. So. That was a good set of questions. I wanna say thank you to everybody who submitted their questions. I wish we could get to all of them because I love all of you individually. Um, a shout out to David Schiller. I appreciate your interest in my specific situation. Uh, there was concern expressed over, you know, I've had a crazy thing happen to me, the whole almost getting arrested thing and, you know, getting forced out of the state of Florida. There are risks being faced currently by students in New College of Florida who are uh, being continuing to do student activism. We've had now three, including myself, students forced to transfer out of New College. So this is absolutely a climate that is dangerous and oppressive. So we're going to unfortunately start to wrap it up as we've got about two minutes left in the hour. I want to thank so much uh, Open Society University Network, Penn America, and Bard College who have put forth the resources to get all this done and to hunt down these awesome professors to speak to us. Um, Please, please remember that the next lecture at 4 Alt New College will be happening at 12.15 tomorrow, that's noon 15, not midnight 15. It's going to be on young people and how they can change America via youth voting and political power. Um, I'd like to point you all to the Alt New College website. It's going to be alt, A-L-T, new college, spelled as you would hope, dot org. Uh, so that is where you can go to get more details on this continuing awesome set of lectures uh, that we're going to be doing via Alt New College. Um, Otherwise, if you're interested in supporting New College as a whole, please, please reach out to our alumni organizations that have been working to help students like me. We have the Novo Collegiate Alliance, which has done amazing work to support me throughout all of the drama that Chris Rufo has put me through. Um, if you're interested in helping you know, via donations, there is the novocollegian.org slash critical dash needs fund if you're interested in putting some cash towards student activism. But thank you all so much for attending. This has been an amazing inaugural lecture for Alt New College. Long live gender studies, long live queerness. Music